December 25th. The time will always be from 6.30 to 8 p.m., but sometimes the date might be a little bit different. So the dates to know are September 25th, October 2nd, October 9th, November 6th, November 20th, and December 4th. And the odds that 99% of you did not just remember that calendar I said, so you can go out into the Welcome Center and pick up this sheet. It's on the table right behind the couch. That way you've got all the information. But for any, any women who want to be involved, we encourage you as our women's group kind of got out to a really good start last fall and in the spring with our Esther study. And now we're gonna be doing Seamless, which is understanding the Bible as one complete story. So we really encourage you to be a part of that. If you have any questions about that, I encourage you to see Beth, Beth Choco, Christy Kidron, or Sarah Wiglandowski. And if you don't know them, if those three individuals are in here, please raise your hand so that way we can start to identify you in any ways. Beth Choco is literally walking down the aisle right now. That's a great person to know, okay? So if you have any questions, please go see Beth. It'd be a great opportunity to be a part of it. Pastor Harlan's not gonna be with us this morning. Unfortunately, he's got a bit of a stomach bug this morning, which being a soccer coach, I know it's been going around the schools everywhere. All of you parents with kids in schools right now, you probably know it's just been everywhere. So we'll make sure to be in prayer for him and his family that it's hopefully something that's taken care of quickly and it can be done with so that way he's back to being a full-time a bunch of different things because we know Harlan does quite a lot. But as we prepare to go into a time of worship, if you could, please, let's bow our heads and take a moment to just invite the Holy Spirit into this place. Father God, we thank you so much for the opportunity to gather freely each and every morning to be together as the body of Christ, to fellowship, to worship, and to learn, God. So as we prepare to go into this time, just allow our hearts and minds to be open to the Holy Spirit, to be moved, to be taken to new places and for our faith to grow deeper and for us to feel further connected to you. So bless this time that we have together to praise your name, to worship your name, and allow your spirit to be felt in this place. We ask this all in your precious name. Amen. Good morning, Faith Cove. We are absolutely thrilled that you're with us this morning, whether you're joining us here in person or online. If you are able to do so, please stand as we as we worship together the one who is without it.
one who called the earth into being has also called us to be a part of his family. As we fill this place with his praise, let's remember to shout aloud, there is no one like him at your name. Don't lose. 
So, uh, sorry, Joe, I just turned on and was, this past week was the 60th anniversary of the four girls who lost their lives in the bombing uh, from the Ku Klux Klan. And I don't know if you watch national news, but they asked this one girl who survived, you know, what were you thinking? What did you, how did you handle it? And she just said, all I said was Jesus. And I thought, what do you say in moments of just, you're overwhelmed? You, you want to shout his name. It sounds great in a song. But in that moment, I stood here last week and we talked about, you know, national global tragedy. Here we are again, Libya, just very little coverage on the news, if you noticed. It's like, and yet massive loss of human life. I don't know where you go when things are just bigger than you. You know, how do you respond? I'm shocked that somebody would say, all who are weary, all who are thirsty, all who are hurting, all who are broken show up here. I think, 
I don't want to be in that group, and I certainly don't want that group with me, right? There's only one person who says, I'll take you. You can come to me. If that's not a statement of who he is, I don't know what is. But if you turn any place else but to him, you'll leave with your brokenness, your weariness, your thirstiness. And then we give you a temporary fix, but not a fix that'll sustain you. I have no answers except one. The one who said, come to me. Let's do that this morning. Father, in this place, with a myriad of needs, even with this size group, it's, it's more than any person here could handle, but not more than you can handle. And what's amazing to me is you invite us to come in that condition with all of our struggles. You never get tired of hearing me bring something to you. You never say, that's enough. <laughs> okay, your 50 minutes is up. I'll send you the bill. Can you go home now? You're not that way. I pray we would follow. I pray we'd, and our first step would just to be moved toward you. That's the first step of following. Just come to me. Whatever that means for us, however we do it today, I pray the inclination of our heart is to say, I'm not going to move away from you, but I'll move toward you. Help me to do that, Spirit of God. Use worship and word, uh, testimony, everything that's said here and done here. Warm my heart toward you, for you are the rock. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. So, Linda, let me invite you up here. Right. I'm Linda, and I'm wondering if all the people that come down normally that are younger with the brown box and their friends would come down and hang out with me for a minute. <laughs> Oh, there's lots of you guys. Oh, and you brought the brown box. You want to come up and sit right here? Oh, wow. Well, I'm really excited to be here this morning. When I first came to this church and I watched Josh do the brown box, I thought that is the coolest thing I've ever seen. And I thought, wow. So all these friends come and they, somebody brings a brown box with something special in it. And then Josh has to open that brown box and figure out how to make a connection and a profound story connecting God to what's in this brown box. And I thought, that is so cool. And then when Pastor Harlan asked me to come and do the brown box, I thought, oh my gosh, that's kind of scary. What if I don't know? Right? And I'm new at this. My name is Linda. So I'm hoping you guys will help me if I get stuck. Will you help me if I get stuck? Okay, good. Thank you. And I know that hard things are always hard until they're easy. So I guess we just have to try it, right? So what's in this brown box, Betsy? What is it? Oh, it's a bottle cap. Wow, can I see that? A, oh, it's not a Star Wars action figure. Yes! <laughs> I was kind of worried. I don't know that very well. So Betsy, tell me more about this bottle cap. Where, how, did you find it? Did somebody give it to you? I found it on a camping trip. On a camping trip. And who were you camping with? My family. Your family. And so you were just camping away, and then you found this special treasure. And what made you decide to keep this and, and to take it home with you? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's really pretty. It's got some colors on it. It's got some red and some blue and some white. It looks very patriotic. I don't know what type it is. What type is it? What do you think? It's a Pepsi lid? Ah, okay. All right. And so we know that this symbol represents something important, right? Something Pepsi, right? Something that we know, right? And when we think about things that represent things that we know, well, exactly, they represent things. And so I guess that reminds me of us. Do you know that we can be representatives? We can represent something to other people around us. So when people see us, they go, oh, that person reminds me of something. Like this lid reminds me of some kind of really too sugary beverage, right? So when you think about it, um, 
how you are, how you show up in the world, how you show up to your friends, how you show up to people on recess, how you show up to your teacher or your family, that is something that people can count on and that they can connect with and they can remember, right? And it kind of inspires them. You know how this kind of inspires you to think about Pepsi, right? Yeah, or our flag, right? And so when we think about it, we can inspire people to think about things that they might not have thought about before. Like maybe it's they, they think of you and they see you and they think, oh, she's a kind person. I like her. And she reminds me to be kind because I'm kind because she's kind to other people, right? And God does that. When we think of God, what do you think of? When you think of Jesus, what do you think of? What does it represent to you? It's hard to, yeah. When I think of all of you and your happy faces and your smiling, your joy, it reminds me that Jesus made each one of you unique and special and one of a kind. And so that would, that's what it reminds me of. Thank you so much for sharing your, your lid with, with me. All right, so we're supposed to say the Lord's Prayer together. Yeah? Do you guys all know it? Kind of? All right. With some, do you know it already? Yeah, would you like to stand into the microphone? All right, let's do it. Let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, how will be my name. The kingdom come, and will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily breath, and forgive us our trespasses. And please forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The kingdom and the power and the glory is us. Amen. Wow, wonderful job. Thank you. So I know that hard jobs are always easier with a friend. So I want to just say thank you for being my friends and for walking through this brown box experience with me. Who should we give the brown box to? Who hasn't had it for a while? Carrie, have you had it? Is it Carrie? Is that right? Have you had that brown box recently? Okay, it's all yours. Pick something really good and bring it back next week, okay? All right, thank you. You guys can go to class. Thank you. Nice to meet you. You haven't had it at all, so maybe next week you can have it. Okay, well, maybe next week could be your week. Nice to meet you. Okay, good morning. If you're able to stand, if you could stand with me, please, for the scripture this morning. Okay. I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that if you all agree with me, uh, agree with one another so that there may be no divisions among you and that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among, among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. Still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized into the name of Paul? I am thankful that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius. So no one can say that you were baptized into my name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't remember if I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with words of human wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is it is the power of God. The word of God for the people of God. Well, it's good to see you this morning. Uh, Linda, thank you for your debut on the brown box. That was uh, great. Uh, could you lower me a little bit, Joe? Not, not so much. Thanks. Okay. If you weren't watching that, you didn't see my little funny this morning. That's all you get, too. Uh, if this is your first time with us this morning, thanks for coming. I'll be at the back doors when you leave. I'd love to meet you personally. Um, we started last week talking about that statement that uh, Isaac mentioned, the, the gospel changes everything. Maybe, maybe you've seen it on the front 
of the uh, sign out front that when you pull in here, and uh, it's this idea that this announcement that God sent his son to, to rescue and restore us, to bring us back into a relationship with the Father and with each other, begins to change every aspect of our lives. It, it connects us not only with God and, and one another, but it calls us to be a part of a community, something bigger than we can create for ourselves. Now, if you heard that message last week, I mean really heard it, it could have easily sounded a bit un-American to you. Certainly unconventional. A friend of mine listened to it and he texted me and he said, nice communist service. A little extreme, I think, but, but at least he heard something that poked him, you know. But Paul, the author of this letter, starts out to this uh, church in Columbus, actually Corinth, and he's saying, hey, the relationship that you have with Jesus isn't just a me thing. Sure, sure it's personal, but it's also a communal. When you attach, attach yourself to Christ, you attach yourself to everyone he's attached to. Haven't you heard that line, when you marry the girl, you marry the family? I hope that happened for you, right? I mean, you know, you, you join in the whole, right? So before the apostle addresses any specifics or any issues, he's laying out a, a foundational concept, a framework of how the walk of faith is supposed to work, how it's a, a me and a we connection, how it's supposed to be a team experience. And I gave you this little formula, me and we, and then I said, well, actually, if you read the old King James Version of the Bible, it says the you and ye, the you all, the plural of you. And yet, in our hyper-individualistic world, where autonomy and privacy are, you know, prized above almost everything else, this concept can rub us the wrong way. I mean, you know, even if you didn't bristle last week at what you heard, chances are you really didn't make any changes either. Now, I ended the service by making some suggestions, places to consider. Start with a commitment to Jesus. If you've always just kind of been a, you know, I just kind of am a window shopper when it comes to church and faith stuff, but I've never taken a step and made a commitment to call him Lord and me servant, or I, he leads, I follow. Whoa, that's a different arrangement. That was the step I say, well, start there. And you say, well, I, I've made that. Then how about a contribution? How about you give something of yourself away because now you're a part of something more than just yourself? And so some of you, you know, you have skills and abilities to help with a website or run sound or, you know, flip slides or play music. You think, ah, you know, give your money. No, no, I'm, I'm, no, no it's, it's still just all, you know, me. Well, me makes a contribution. And me makes a connection to a we. The Bible study for the ladies or the Sunday school class or come some kind of group where you start connecting, even when we meet and greet. Uh, okay, I do the two people next to me. How about walk across the aisle? The people on this side, they're really pretty nice. Maybe not as nice as this side, but they're nice. But we start to move. Well, today, the passage, hopefully you heard it. The Apostle Paul is going to squeeze us on this concept a little further, Okay. I do a spin and core class every Tuesday morning. And uh, this past week, the instructor had a new routine that she had never done before. And, and, and I felt it. I mean, I, it felt so bad, it felt good. You, you know what I mean by that? Well, that's Paul's goal. And that's mine this morning. To press us so that the pain equals some gain. Listen again to the text. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all, that's what the actual is, you all agree with one another in what you say and that there be no divisions among you and that you all be perfectly united in mind and thought. Okay, <laughs> how's that going to happen? I mean, talk about a new level, right? Total agreement, no divisions, perfect unity. You couldn't get group this size, all to agree on where to go for lunch, right? You, you couldn't do it, let alone, you know, on touchy subjects like uh, who to vote for and issues of race and gender in this country. I mean, how's this supposed to happen? During the last election and the pandemic, I saw division and divisiveness rip through our country. 
family and friends, co-workers, even church members who had enjoyed what they thought was a happy and a harmonious relationship got shredded on issues of surrounding personality and public policy. Many of those relationships still haven't been restored. And now, with like a hurricane off the coast, right, ready to strike, we've got another election looming, and COVID numbers are rising again, to say nothing of the legal battles that both the former and current president are dealing with. So, so let me ask you, did you see a side of the church, of this church, of you that was disappointing during that season? I certainly did, right? Are, are we enter any better prepared for the next round? Because in case you haven't noticed, here it comes, folks. Did we learn anything from the last time? How will we look and act differently on this iteration? Now, my focus today is the church. For sure, the whole, but I only speak here, so practically to us, this community. Do we know how to disagree without being disagreeable? Can we have differences without divisions? Do you know how many folks today see the church as polarizing to the point that they stay away from it? For all the talk of diversity and inclusion and that we're a part of a pluralistic culture, even this big kingdom of God that's so deep and wide, we can be pretty tribal. We can be pretty petty more shallow than deep, more narrow than wide. And in many cases, the ranks get trimmed down so that those who are here are just those who are the same. They align and agree with my you know, slate of opinions and perspectives. And when that happens, when any group just agrees with the me, when we're all the same, then where's the we? Is the church just like some club, you know, like the Moose Lodge? You, you know, even at Rotary, they pray, and they do a lot of good things for people. Are those places more diverse, more inclusive than the church? Do you know your history? <laughs> Diversity and inclusion have been the trademarks of Christianity. Coming together under one roof, having a relationship with each other where you called one another brother and sister. You had slaves and free. You had Jews and Gentiles. You had male and female. I mean, not only was it unheard of before, it was offensive. And yet it was a reflection of how the gospel changes everything. It changes your relationships. Can I tell you something? I don't need much Jesus to hang out with my friends. They like me, I like them, we like the same thing. Hey, pretty easy, right? And if anything gets a little too uncomfortable, eh, we just drift, let it go and find some new friends. No biggie. Is the church any different today? Are we just a group of quote unquote friends who like each other and like the same things and add a little Jesus in there for good measure? Or are we something truly different? Something that causes other people to scratch their head. How did this group of people get together? And it's not just the what that brought them together. It's the who. The church of Jesus Christ that he's bringing about is this diverse, eclectic kind of assembly. And the only way we're going to stay what he wants us to be is if we stay connected to him, to his priorities, to his agenda. That's got to dominate our differences. Otherwise, we'll fragment and we'll be in our own little groups. Now, what I'm going to say next is true, I think, in multiple settings. Okay, I want to show how it applies here, but I think this is like say, valuable for any group that wants to kind of find some unity. Common ground is found by reaching for higher ground. You got to go above your petty personal perspectives. 
The koinonia, the, the, the fellowship, the bond and unity that brought the early Christians together wasn't their economic opportunities. You know, Amway people, let's all, you know, networking, not, you know, this is why we go here. It wasn't their cultural alignment. Hey, we all, you know, like this, do these same things. Even our traditional affiliations, it was none of those things. It was the gospel. It was this one event, this one truth, this shared experience that overcame every other chasm and barrier. I, I, I've like you, I've watched tons of movies and read books where you, you know, these, these you know, great stories of unlikely souls coming together through some kind of shared experience. You know, they're always stuck in the uh, airport or, or, you know, they're all in the cancer ward or in a foxhole and they, you know, get connected to one another. I mean, you ever been to an AA meeting? I, 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 I love those groups because that they have found sobriety and they don't want to lose it and they understand that their, need, their me needs is met through a we connection. Well, welcome to the Christian life. This is biblical Christianity. It's the me and we thing. So that means navigating our differences, our diff disagreements is a must if we're going to exist as we're supposed to be, let alone expand. Which, by the way, is the thrust of the New Testament? To go and make disciples of who? My friends, the people like me. No, all nations. There's some differences, right? All peoples. And it's not just give and send. No, no, it's you make connections. You form relationships. You cross boundaries. I don't know the name. I don't know the culture. I don't like their preferences and their choices. And the, yeah, it's, it's this kind of diversity that makes us truly distinct. Like I said, the church is a Jesus thing. Not just a me thing. My friends, not just a me thing. This has got to be something else. Have you, you know, heard what the probably number one reason that couples say they divorce? You hear the phrase often, don't you, right? Irreconcilable differences. Well, opposites always have differences, right? So one time they attracted, how did they become irreconcilable? Is it because the me got in the way of the we? And so we bail. Look how Paul attempts to get us to come back together. He starts with an appeal for agreement. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus, that you all agree. Uh, too, too many of us, I think, would we sense a strain or a rift taking place, you know? We either ignore it or avo avoid it. We, we don't engage it. We rarely fight for the relationship. You know, moving on, changing friendships, even changing churches has become commonplace. That nobody even notices. Hey, so-and-so doesn't come anymore. Whatever happened? I don't know. I, I did a wedding last week, and, and I mentioned to the folks how, how you are witnesses of what's taking place here. And what the usual don't just watch what's happening, but you're to testify in the days ahead what you saw. I saw you make a vow to that person, for better, for worse. You're to remind them of the choice and the commitment they're making. That's the idea of this appeal. I'm, I'm reminding you of something fundamental. Now, when we hear appeal, we typically only think of in a courtroom. You know, I don't like the decision, so I appeal it, and I want them to review it in some way. But Paul's saying it's not a matter of law here that he's emphasizing. It's a matter of relationship. That's what it's broken. There's a brotherhood here. There's a, a family. There's a, a, a relationship that he's appealing we, we hold on to. We don't let go of it. Somebody would say this is worth fighting for. And even if you sit today and think, well, you know, it's not that big of a deal. I really don't care for those folks anymore. We just, just disagree in that. Then he says, well, if it's not the relationship, then how about his reputation? If that doesn't move you for the group, then how about for the Christ who formed the group? I appeal to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. You know, I'm not, I'm not using some trump card, not because I'm the boss or I hold the purse strings, right? It's for Christ's sake. 
because the world looks out there and says, this church is it's so fragmented. These Christians can't even get together. What does that say about Jesus? How does that not just lessen his witness that he's the one that can reconcile us to the Father and to himself and to others when his own people can't reconcile with one another? Are you going to go to those people to help you with your personal rifts when they can't get it together themselves? So he's appealing for agreement. He's appealing for unity. Now, listen. Listen. This is not uniformity. This isn't appeasement. You know, just, just go along to get along. No, no, no. That's, just, just hear them out. He's saying, I don't want there to be any divisions. I don't want any divisive spirit. I want there to be a priority for unity, to have the same mind and the same thought. There'd be some what we'd call harmony. Isn't that what you hear up here when you're singing, right? They got different voices, different sounds, but all, you know, one band, one orchestra playing one song that captivates the soul and captures the attention of a watching world. Now, we'll get to the schisms and the strategy Paul employs to get us back together, but I want you to first notice something I think is quite rare. I don't know if you picked it up the first time, but but I think this is essential. If we're going to have authentic unity here, My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. You catch what's going on here? Not only is Paul calling them out about their quarrels, their fractures, their their, misguided loyalties, but he's telling them his source. It's Chloe's people. Folks, Folks from her household visited you all and heard your murmuring and muttering in the pew or what you said in the bathroom or the back room. You know, your, your likes and dislikes, your pride and preference about one preacher over another. And they told Paul about it. Now before you think, well, what's the big deal? I mean, everybody has preferences. You like one restaurant over another. I mean, that, that's just a matter of taste. What works for me? There's nothing personal there. Just give me a minute and I'll hope to show you how it was more than that. But I want you first to notice that what did Chloe's people do here? Did they rat <laughs> the Corinthians out? They think on them to the apostles who he'd give them what for, you know? Listen, this wasn't gossip or slander because it was passed along, but not as an unnamed source. This wasn't, well, you know, I know others who feel that way, right? And they weren't acting like they're some self-appointed person speaking up for the silent majority. You've heard these kind of people that talk this way. It's like, well, who are these people? Oh, I can't tell you that. There's none of that. He says, no, it's Chloe's folks. You're wondering who said it? I'll tell you, it's Chloe. And they're happy that I'm saying because they're concerned for true restoration. Look, if you're going to pass something along, some concern, and you should, say something, right? Put your name on it. No anonymous notes, no drive-by shooting. Where'd that come from? I don't know, you know. How's that going to restore a relationship when you don't know who's got the issue? I I found it to be true that when people share something and it's for the common good, they really want to build the relationship back up. They don't mind being quoted because they care about the connection. I I certainly want to hear comments and concerns people have for the health and well-being of this church, of my input to this place. I appreciate it. I need it. But if you're sincere, sign it. And that's Paul's point. We need to accept others' perspectives. You need to hear how others perceive your actions, your attitudes, your comments. That's what impacts them. That's what was happening here. You think it was just a casual statement about who you like and who you didn't like. Always people felt, man... Such divisiveness, such preferential, such pride, such this crack was forming a separation. They could see this slowly relationships. Hearts weren't as connected as they once were. That's what's going on. People pick it up. We don't always pick it up. But you wonder, what happened to that person? Where'd they go? 
But if you trace back, you could see the steps little by little, the comments that made that they were fracturing. And Paul's calling it out, lest the church lose its witness in the community. Now, a lot of commentators and scholars have tried to look at these differences and said, well, what's behind this statement? You know, I'm of a Paul, I'm of a policy for Christ. You know, what did all that mean? So my guess, I think, is good as theirs. Look at Paul, right? I'm of Paul. What would that mean? Well, he was the guy that started this church. So, you know, he was the, like the founding pastor. So, so, so to claim that you're following Paul, you know, that it's like you saying, well, my opinion and my perspective is basically what Paul would have wanted. That, that's the way we always did things. Those are the loyalists, right? <laughs> These are the folks that have been here from the beginning. They've had squatters' rights. We, you know, we've been here the longest. We know we don't need any other input. The irony in that statement is if you knew Paul, you would never promote Paul. He wasn't into it, but people do that. They'll name drop like that. Then there's the Apollos. Well, I'm of Apollos. Well, you know, he was the more progressive. He, he was, you know, trying, always willing to try new things, a little edgy. His concern was work. I mean, whatever work. He, he was the pragmatist of the group, you know, always wanted to connect with the outsiders. And others were like, yeah, you know, you can't argue with, with success here, so you got to go with Apollos. And then there's others that said, well, what, I'm with Cephas. That's Peter. I mean, and he was with Jesus. I mean, come on. I mean, this, these are the traditionalists. I mean, who's before that, right? I mean, you, you know, and if Jesus appointed him with tradition, he's got to trump everything. And then, of course, you always have the hyper-spiritualists, those that feel like they don't need anybody or anything because they've got Jesus, me and the Holy Spirit, and they're, I follow Christ. Well, how are you going to argue with that one? Well, the Lord told me to do that. It's like, you, you know, these are the elitist. These are the folks that just, you know, they, they, they think they got the answer because God has told them. Look, there's always going to be differences, different opinion, different churches, different denominations. Yeah. And those differences come based on our backgrounds and our economic status and our racial differences. Yeah, but differences doesn't mean divisions. It doesn't have to mean separations. And so Paul asks these questions. Well, was, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? What do you think of these statements? Are these just rhetorical questions? I just, or or do they, does the answer to them you know, indicates some direction of where our unity ought to be, where we ought to put our emphasis, lest we divide. I think that's exactly what's going on here. This is the common ground that I need to find, and it's on higher ground. I, I think these three questions can give us some practical direction for us. Years ago, I heard this funny story. Maybe you've heard it. It's been around a long time. Guy had cracks in his basement wall. You hear this one, you know, and he got a painter. Kevin came over and he patched it and painted it. And it looked real nice and it worked good for six months. And then the cracks came back, but the guy brought his relatives, you know, cousins and nephews and nieces. And all kinds of cracks were in the bay. He's like, oh my gosh. So he called somebody else in, you know, not another painter. He figured that guy didn't go do a good job. He brought another guy in and he says, well, you're your problem's not the wall, it's the foundation. It keeps shifting, and that's why it's making worse and worse. You've got a foundation problem. See, I think this is what Paul's getting at, is a foundation for us. I don't know what all brought us together, but this is the foundation that's going to keep us together. I, I, the last church I served has been together 175 years. I think that, that's really impressive. They've been there that long, right? But you know the number of people that are attending who are below 60? Very few. <laughs> who hasn't heard of the recent split in the Methodist church? Right? How many Protestant denominations are there today? <laughs> and how many were started because of a division and a split? What happened to the Lord's Prayer? John 17. Praying for the unity of his people. Listen, don't get me wrong. The church of Jesus Christ is growing. 
It's growing worldwide, and it's even growing here in Columbus. This past week, I met with folks from Rock City and One Church. And they're different. Boy, their demographics are different. Their style's different. But there's one common thing that was so clear between the two of them. The focus, the reason for being was the gospel reaching more and more people for Christ. I, I want to give you my takeaways from those three statements. But first, I want you to hear this emphasis that Paul made. I thank God that I didn't baptize anyone except Crispus and Gaius so that no one could say you were baptized in my name. I don't remember if I baptized only a household of Stephanus, right? Why? Verse 17, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. There it is. There's the focus. Here his priority, what's important, this is mission critical. It's it's not your position on politics. It's not even your view of human sexuality or your preference on music. I'm not saying those things aren't important. And we ought to discuss them, but not divide over them and not get distracted by them. The cross of Christ is what's central to the Christian faith. And when the church stops making Christ clear and picks other issues, People don't hear what's most important, and the church stops being the church. Now, let me give you a quick three specifics of history, just so you think, oh, where's this coming from? Go look at Acts 7, 15. When the church first had Gentiles come in, people were different, the elders said, let's make it easy for them. Let's not make it hard, try to make them like us, believe all the things we believe, act all the way we do. No, make it easy for them to get in, because they believe the main thing. There's the precedence, Acts 15. How about the issue of polygamy? That's a problem. You think, oh my gosh. You know how prevalent it was in the early church? So much so, if you read the scriptures, they said, well, we're not going to ordain leaders who were in polygamous relationships because they were plentiful in the church. But do you hear much teaching about it in the New Testament? No. Why not? Because their emphasis was, get them to Jesus. He'll work things out like he's worked things out with you and me. And the church dealt with an issue that was quite controversial in its day. Have you read the Apostles' Creed? Oldest statement of the Christian faith. What's not in that document? You probably, some of you have heard it all your whole life. What's not in it? Not one statement of morality or church practice in there. The emphasis is on what we believe. Why? Because what we believe changes our behavior. But when you focus on behavior and not belief, you don't get change. You get division. That's history. The church has known how to do this. This is how we got so diverse. But if we're in a culture and country where our diversity is lessening in the church, did we lose our foundation? Is Christ divided? Not at all. Here, here's my first thing. Can we not emphasize a greater kind of unity? Not denominational unity, but be a part truly of the kingdom. Can we not have events and gatherings that emphasize a wider birth of the Christian faith? Can we not affiliate and associate with other entities, use their books, materials, partnerships, and conferences as like the big church of believers? I don't speak ill of any ministry. I might not particularly go to there or care for them, but I'm not going to speak negatively. They're another man's servant. It's not my place to judge them. They serve the Lord. What about that kind of an attitude? You know, there's an organization here in town called For Columbus. They put out a prayer sheet for the city. If you notice in your bulletin this past week, we put in a prayer calendar for you to pray every day. And on Wednesdays, we put pray for our community, our city. Because on Wednesdays, that's what Fort Columbus does. And what they said is that when the alarms go off at noon, and you're all bothered by them, that's your reminder to pray for the city of Columbus. Why can't we join with thousands of other Christians around this place praying for our city? Why can't we be a focus on the church of Jesus Christ, universal, not my specific? Was Paul crucified for you? <laughs> How ridiculous, right? I'm glad you like that Bible teacher or that preacher. You think, man, they're amazing. They helped me so much. They, it was only Jesus working through them. 
Can't we promote a greater savior? I mean, nobody else saved you. That marriage didn't save you. That group didn't save you. That person didn't save you. Only one is the savior. When we emphasize ministry and people, we take an emphasis off of Jesus. Can we not promote him? Were you baptized into the name of Paul? No. Don't, okay, baptism is great. If you've never obeyed the Lord in baptism, we got a tank here. It's ready to get fired up. We'd love to put you in it, okay? So we'll bring a nice white robe. You look pretty. The weather's still nice. It won't be too bad. We'll get you a towel. That's not his point. But his point is, can't we celebrate a greater decision than whose church you joined or who baptized you or whose ministry you're a part of? Isn't the greatest celebration the new birth? <laughs> did, did you look at your newsletters this week? Did you go to the end? Did you see the uh, Westlake's got a grandbaby? Beth's got a great man, great baby? Is that, is that where are you, Beth? I don't know, you're out there somewhere. It's a great, it's a great, right? Okay, cool stuff, celebrate new life. How about the new life of new birth in Christ? What should be more thrilling to the church of Jesus Christ than new life? You got space in this place? Let's put some new babies here. Let's everybody get pregnant in Jesus. Amen. <laughs> Don't drink the water. Don't worry, it's all good. Should that not be us? Should we not be a family that's expanding and growing that can include and welcome and Sure, there's differences. Oh my gosh, that's what makes it so tasty. But not divisions, not separations, because our foundation is clear. I got here the same way you got here, because of him. And that's why we'll stay, and that's why we'll stay together. Let's pray. God, I uh, thank you for this faith community here. I thank you for Faith Cove. I thank you, Lord, for testimony they've had um, for the years they've existed. I pray in the days ahead, Lord, you would, in your kindness, draw more and more to yourself and be confident we would be a good family, healthy parents to love and nurture those who come to believe. I pray you'd preserve our unity and it would build, it would build the allow for all kinds of perspectives and views and we wouldn't feel threatened. We'd feel stretched and challenged, but only to see a greater expression of this kingdom that we say is so deep and so wide. And we are so grateful to be a part of. I pray today, Lord, that if we felt poked and pushed by you, it only be so that you could add another into this place, one we love and celebrate. Do it for your name's sake. Jesus, stand up, pray. Amen. Let's stand together as we're able to do so. And affirm and reaffirm things that we know that are good and true and worthy of the one that we serve. In Christ alone my hope is found He is my life, my strength, my song This cornerstone
It's been so good to have each and every one of you be with us this morning to fellowship, to worship, to celebrate. And as we aspire to be a church that can celebrate new life in Christ and to see more people grow and come to Jesus, one of the ways that we can commit to doing that as believers in Jesus Christ and as members of Faith Covenant Church is we can do that through our giving, our tithes and offerings. So I encourage you, if you have your tithes and offerings here with you in person, there is a basket in the back that you can pass on your way out. Or you have the ability to give online. You can go to our website, faithcub.net, find the Church Life page in the giving tab. It's really easy to get set up and it does it all for you each week. But it really has been so good to have each and every one of you with us. And we encourage you to stay as you leave the sanctuary doors. There will be plenty of warm coffee and good treats for each of you to enjoy as you can fellowship and talk and just be around each other. But as we get ready to go from this place into a new week, I pray that this verse that we're about to say together is not just something that we can recite with our voices, but it's something that we can recite with our hearts. And it's something that we live out each day as we try to bring new life into the body, into the family of Christ. And so let's say this together from 1 Thessalonians 2.8. We loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well, because you have become so dear to us. I pray you all have a wonderful day, a great week, and we look forward to seeing you next Sunday. God bless.